Tonight's speaker is Dr. Richard Veit, Professor of Anthropology and Interim Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Monmouth University. Prior to coming to Monmouth, Dr. Veit worked in the field of historic preservation and directed and participated in numerous archaeological excavations in the eastern United States, as well as in Ireland and New Mexico. He's the author of five books on history and archaeology, including the award-winning Digging New Jersey's Past, Historical Archaeology in the Garden State. Dr. Veit teaches courses on archaeology, cultural anthropology, historical archaeology, Native Americans, and New Jersey history. He also serves on the New Jersey Historical Commission and the board of the National Park Service's Crossroads of the American Revolution Heritage Area. So without further ado, Dr. Richard Veit. Thank you, Dana. That was a wonderful introduction. And my goodness, the Monmouth County Historical Association has a lot of good programs this fall. <laughs> Let me see if I can uh, share my screen and we'll launch into uh, the presentation. Here we go. All right, so it is an honor to be here with all of you this evening talking a little bit about archeology span at some of the Monmouth County Historical Association's historic houses. And these are projects that I've got to, uh, that I've had the opportunity to work on over the past, I'd say sort of two, two and a half years. And as I think you'll see, they're yielding some really interesting information about these historic sites. So in a sense, it's providing a new glance at the history, the hidden history of some of these very old houses. And I called it What Lies Beneath, because I want you to think about these structures as almost sort of the tips of icebergs, because what we see above ground is only part of the story. There's often a whole nother story buried below ground. You might think of this as a tale of three houses. We're going to visit the Allen House in Shrewsbury, where Tavern Fest will be held. Uh, built in the 1680s. It's in fact one of the oldest documented structures in New Jersey uh, by Judah Allen. It famously served as a tavern during the middle of the 1700s, owned for a while by uh, Josiah Halstead, a very interesting individual. It's called the Blue Ball Tavern. During the revolution, there was a skirmish fought there uh, with considerable loss of life. Uh, and it went on to be a doctor's residence, a store, a private residence, an antique shop, all that before finally being preserved by the Monmouth County Historical Association as a museum. We're also going to visit Marlpit Hall on Kings Highway in Middletown. For a long time, we thought that that was a very old structure as well, perhaps dating back to the 1600s. Now it looks like it was probably built in the 1760s. We have tree ring dates that indicate its initial construction. And we know that it was in the Taylor family uh, for much of its history, starting with Edward Taylor in 1771. And there's some really extraordinary archeological deposits that have been found there. Uh, we'll also touch on the Taylor Butler House, uh, where Professor Ziobro's exhibit on 9-11 was recently uh, mounted. And the Taylor Butler House is a mid 19th century house also associated with the Taylor family, Mary Holmes uh, Taylor and Joseph Dorsey Taylor. And it was a show place of a house when it was constructed. So I figured I'd give you all the names and dates to start us off and then we launch into the sites themselves. So here you are on the four corners in Shrewsbury. And this is probably a, you know, a familiar intersection to many of you, though much busier today uh, than it appears in this 19th century illustration. Off to the right, you can see Christ Church before its clock tower was constructed. On the left is the Allen House or the Blue Ball Tavern. Uh, in the center is a building that no longer stands. This would be close to the Shrewsbury Municipal Complex. This was a blacksmith shop. And in the background, uh, you can just catch a glimpse of the Friends or Quaker Meeting House. So this is a critical intersection in Colonial Monmouth County uh, on the main road heading, heading down the shore and a very good place to have a tavern. And most communities in early America had taverns. In fact, all larger communities had to have taverns by law and the, the food and beverages they were serving were actually all regulated uh, by the state. 
This is a 19th century map, a late 19th century map that shows that same intersection. So again, to orient you, here's Christ Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Friends Meeting House, and the Allen House here called a store. And you notice there are a number of other buildings around it during this time period. So this project, and here, here I am at work uh, with an assistant, this was a very practically minded project. Uh, and in fact, the first two projects we'll talk about have really practical outcomes, and the third one is more of a research project. So here we were doing archaeological testing um, in the location of a planned handicapped access ramp to make this great building more accessible to the public. And we wanted to make sure that there were no important archaeological deposits before that ramp was constructed. So we dig these little holes, we call them shovel tests, and they're like our windows into the past. They give us a glimpse of what's below ground. All the soil gets carefully screened and artifacts get bagged later to be washed and cataloged and ultimately returned to the Monmouth County Historical Association. So here are the areas we were looking at, and that's the outline of the house in red, a little area in the back, and there'd be a landing by the back door, and a ramp that would wrap around and go in the front of the building. So it was very interesting. Digging behind the house, we didn't find a whole lot of artifacts. And that's unusual because um, in colonial America, there really is no centralized trash disposal. So most trash goes out into the backyard to be pecked at by chickens and rooted around in by hogs. We did find that there had previously been a step or a set of steps here, a stoop, where we placed our excavation unit. So that's actually good news in terms of moving forward. Down the side, this was a surprise to us, we found ourselves almost immediately in a shallow cellar from an earlier building. And when we did our research, it turned out, and this may not be a surprise to the folks with the Monmouth County Historical Association, but there had been an addition on the Allen House from the 19th century that stood uh, well into the 20th century. We were in the cellar of that structure. So most of the artifacts were pretty pretty recent. However, when we turned the corner, we started coming into 17th and 18th century artifacts. And that's pretty exciting because the 17th century, that's our first period of European settlement or colonial settlement in New Jersey is not very well represented archeologically, but we did find some artifacts that speak to that time period. So here are excavation units. This is the one behind the house. Again, there's evidence for you know modern steps here. We also, we also found the sewer pipe, not exactly the sort of exciting archeological discovery you wanna make. I, I didn't feel quite like Howard Carter at King Tut's tomb when I stumbled on that. The front, again, a little bit different. The soils are much more natural and the artifacts are, are actually much earlier. And these are the types of things we found. And a, again, if you go, let's say, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and see some of their wonderful archaeological collections, um, these are not quite as exciting, but they do warm the archaeologist's heart because they, they tell us a little bit about the past. Ceramics are perhaps the archaeologist's best friend because they're easy to date, they last almost forever, and they can give us good information about the sort of things that people were or eating and in fact, where they were buying things. So here we have some tin glaze um, earthenwares, what we might call Delft from Holland. Uh, these are from the late 1600s or the early 1700s. We have some porcelain from China, getting porcelain from China to Shrewsbury in the 1700s was quite a project. So this speaks to international trade. Here we have a little fragment of a tobacco pipe, so perhaps the most intimate of artifacts, right? You can hold it in your mouth as you're smoking it. Men and women smoked, they weren't aware of the potential health consequences. Some English refined earthenwares, and then some locally made redwares, which are sort of, I like to call them the Tupperware of early America. So it's a nice assortment of pieces that sort of speak to how a table might have been set at the tavern with fine English earthenwares, perhaps some porcelain cups, and even some pieces from Holland, perhaps displayed on a sideboard. So that was pretty, pretty exciting. And as it turns out, here's a 1930s photograph of uh, the Allen House. We were digging right out here. And that is that addition that has now been removed from the Allen House. And you can see it looks like it's probably 
late 19th or early 20th century as a shallow crawl space underneath. So our second site, and again, this is a very practical project, is the Taylor Butler House. And what a house it is. I mean, when this is constructed in the 1850s, it's probably the finest house in Monmouth County, one of the finest in the state. It's a real show place. And it has been beautifully restored and it serves as a wonderful gallery for the Monmouth County Historical Association. We were charged with looking at this building and this is a smokehouse. So one of the things to think about with 18th and 19th century buildings is many of the or functions you would have inside a house today, like a refrigerator, a stove. These are all occurring outside of the house. So smokehouse would have been very important for smoking meats and preserving food in a world where there is not, you know, sort of ready access to refrigeration. And uh, this building is slated for uh, some TLC in a not too distant future. One of the questions we've been asked by the architectural historians is, how deep is the foundation? Do they need to do anything to sort of stabilize it? Because it's getting a little shaky. Uh, so we excavated uh, two excavation units. Here's my uh, partner, hard at work. Um, and what we found, and I'll show you what we found in just a minute, it was pretty interesting. But as we were working, we realized there was a big depression in the ground right in front of us. And it turned out that that depression is another historic structure. And we did just a little bit of testing there. So this historic photo shows in the background, the smokehouse. Right here, this little peak roof is the roof to a very large ice house. And I love these two structures because what they say uh, to me as an archeologist is that, you know, the tailors have sort of a state of the art farm here where they can store ice that would have been cut on local lakes probably all winter. And that would have given them something most of their neighbors didn't have and the ability to cool food and maybe even uh, have uh, cool drinks and perhaps even ice cream. And they're smoking meat. Again, they're sort of taking care of their kitchen here. So this is the outline of uh, the smokehouse. Here are the two excavation units we put next to it. There you can see one of them. You can see some of the brickwork again, it needs a little tender loving care. But down below, well, it's in pretty good shape and it goes about 18 inches down below ground. So it's, it's pretty stable. We're well down into subsoil here. When we did little shovel tests, what I call those windows into the past before, we were able to find the edge of um, the ice house and we were able to test inside it. I could say, uh, you can't get to the bottom of it with, uh, with a shovel or, or even a, an auger probably eight or 10 feet deep. We were able to get about four feet down. Not a lot of artifacts here, but we didn't really expect a lot of artifacts next to a smokehouse. We did have a, the base of a bottle from the middle of the 19th century. So that's good because we think the smokehouse is probably contemporary with the Taylor Butler house, a couple nails from the 19th century and a little bit of, a little bit of shell. So it helps us date the structure. So those were both fun projects. Um, but the work at Marl Pitt Hall is, I think, really kind of extraordinary. And um, Marl Pitt Hall is a wonderful structure, again, dating back uh, to the middle of the 18th century, the Taylor family's home for many generations. Today, you might look at it and say, compared to many modern houses, it's not particularly large. Uh, but this was, when it was constructed, a very fine house. And I would call it a house built in sort of the Anglo-Dutch tradition of East Jersey. So we have things like a split front door, sometimes called the Dutch door, where you could open the top of the door, keep the bottom closed so that chickens and dogs and animals don't wander in and out. And maybe you can also keep a tradesman on the porch instead of, instead of letting, letting him in or a peddler on the porch. It has a great roof, what you might think of as sort of a cat slide or salt box roof where the pitch of the front and the back are a little bit different. And then to the right is what was almost certainly the original kitchen. And you heard about uh, the living and breathing project or the beneath the floorboards project, right? To interpret the lives of the African-American inhabitants of this house. So one of the things that's important, and actually let me show you another photo of the 
area. We'll come back to another photo of the house. But one of the things that's important to think about with places like uh, Morrow Pit Hall and the Allen House is that, and this is a sad aspect of New Jersey's past, but there were enslaved people living in New Jersey up to the Civil War. We have a Gradual Emancipation Act in 1804 that uh, begins to free uh, substantial numbers of individuals. But many of these households, and this would have been true at both the Allen House, um, Moral Pit Hall, many of these households include both free white individuals, generally the homeowners, and enslaved and sometimes free African American individuals. Here we are, this is the, the site. This is the Taylor Butler house in the 19th century map. Uh, that's Marl Pitt Hall. They're on the same larger property. And Marl Pitt Hall is moved um, in the early 20th century. We're not exactly sure how far it's moved and the maps make it a little bit hard to trace the exact uh, sort of location uh, that it's moved from. But as you'll see at the end of this presentation, I have a theory for you about what happened that I. I'd love your input on. Here's another early view of the, of the house. So again, we have these mixed families living in the houses, enslaved people, um, and, um, and the owners of the homes. And historians like Graham Russell Hodges and locally Joe Grabus, Walter Grayson, Rick Gefkin have spent a lot of time thinking about studying um, the existence of people in structures like this one and what their lives were like. And I think a couple things are worth emphasizing. This is different than the large plantations we would have seen in the South during this time period, but I would say it's no better uh, for those enslaved people. In fact, being in the same house uh, with their enslavers must have been very challenging. So being there 24 seven, sort of constantly under surveillance and their lives are often sort of underrepresented in the historical record, but archeology span and the sorts of find that finds that Joe and Bernadette are making inside the house, I think have the potential to provide a lot of important new information. All right, just another photograph, a uh, historic photograph showing Mall Pit Hall in the main block of the house kitchen wing. Looks like there's some outbuildings back here and some fenced yards. And over here across the road, which has now been realigned, is a large range of barns that would have supported the farmstead here. Now this is uh, for, this is certainly my favorite photograph of the house. And this is a historic Americans, American building survey photograph from the 1930s. So during the Great Depression, the federal government lots of out of work historians and architects back to work drawing and photographing America's historic buildings. This happened across the entire United States and has been continued in uh, Hawaii and Alaska. And it provides us a wonderful record of what some of these buildings looked like in the 1930s. And not only is this a great photograph of the building, which has been moved when this photograph was taken, but I found it striking uh, that there was a gentleman who appears to be an African-American gentleman posed in front of the house because uh, African-American individuals play a key role in the life of this structure. This is a drawing also from the Historic American Building Survey. It was done by Herbert Smith and it shows you the rooms inside. So by 18th century standards, this is sort of a fancy house. You have a center hall, that guests would have entered. You have um, sort of your best rooms in the front of the house facing south, the living room, dining room. The kitchen had been replaced by this time period. And upstairs, uh, you would have had sleeping quarters. Over here, you have the original kitchen that's been expanded. And again, upstairs, you would have had sleeping quarters probably used uh, by those enslaved individuals. Now, I owe a sincere apology uh, to the Garden Club of Middletown because the discovery I'm going to tell you about happened in their 
garden. It's it is really an attractive garden. We got to see it come come to bloom this past year. And the backstory here is that um, my good friend and colleague Joe Zemla was doing some work around the garden, and he noticed some historic artifacts. And he dug a little bit to try and expose them, and he found himself in an incredibly rich deposit of mostly what I would call colonial artifacts. And this raises, I'll show you the artifacts in a minute, it raises a number of questions. Who put them there? When were they put there? What are they doing there? What do they tell us about the lives of the people in Royal Pitt Hall and Middletown more broadly during this time period? So those are some of the questions that we're going to try to answer. So this is that same garden. Um, and some archaeologists hard at work. You can see Joe in the background, and we've got Ryan Radice and Eric Lowenstein and Aretta Vogue, uh, Marilyn Sherpin, and Rick Altenberg, um, essentially Mammoth students and Mammoth uh, graduates who have worked with me in the past. We put together sort of a crack team to work on this. And this is the area where Joe had been finding artifacts. So we've opened up a five foot square, not a huge excavation but enough to provide four, four of those big Rubbermaid coats full of artifacts, um, so enough to tell a story. And again, we're screening all the soil. Here's Rick Hart at work. So soil colors really mean something to archeologists. So you can see here, the soil's sort of yellowish. And here it's a lot darker. And it really appears that, well, we have a foundation and inside this foundation is a pit. And that is what Rick is excavating. And that pit was chock-a-block full of artifacts. Um, here's a screen after it's been shaken a little bit. And this is, you know, this is an archaeologist's fantasy. Uh, typically, you shake a screen and you get like one little thing. And Aretta here has, you know, dozens and dozens of artifacts out of one bucket. So just amazingly productive. And I should say, I. I've worked, I've had the pleasure, I mean, it's an honor to work on a number of wonderful archeological sites in Monmouth County, um, at Sandy Hook Lighthouse, uh, up at the uh, Seabrook Wilson House on the Bay Shore. And I've talked to Gail Hunton, who works for Monmouth County Parks about some of the sites. And, and one of the things we've commiserated about is often the sites are not particularly artifact rich. Well, this site is very, very, I skipped through that a little bit too quickly. So here we are, first layer of soil has been excavated. Again, you can see there's a bit of a wall here. We think some of that wall was removed. And here's the floor of the unit. And you can still see sort of a stain from this pit. And then there what might have been post molds or other, what we call features, these sort of stains in the soil here. I have numbers on them. All right, All right so these are primarily artifacts uh, that that Joe found. And this is kind of amazing, right? You're looking at dozens, and I didn't show you all the broken pieces from the sides of the bottles, dozens of bottle fragments. And the way I've sorted them here is by bases and by necks, because that's how we start to count how many bottles were in this pit. They're a lot. And they're very uniform in form. This bottle is from around 1790, it's intact. Um, these are about the same time period. So I would say just after the American Revolution. Another thing to bear in mind is it looks like these bottles were probably tossed into this pit hole and broke when they arrived there. If they had been sort of tossed out in the yard or broken in the yard, we'd have much smaller fragments, more like what you saw um, let's say at the Allen House. So a tremendous number of bottles. And that may tell us something about sort of beverage consumption or entertaining. These are primarily used for alcoholic beverages, mostly wine, but you can also have rum in them. They're not gonna have beer in them very often because they're getting sort of casks of beer. The other popular drink in colonial New Jersey is hard cider. And that too is uh, typically coming in little little casts. So we're probably looking at wine consumption. Uh, and that's that's an expensive practice. This this 
points to how wealthy the tailors were. The, the picture came out a little more artistic than I had intended, but these are the bases of tumblers, of glasses that you would use uh, with those bottles of wine or rum. And they're all sort of very early 1800s. They're hand blown and you can see the scars from that uh, production process on their bases. We call those pontal marks. And this is a little bit of a, a stemware glass of a wine glass. But with all those wine bottles, there were dozens and dozens and dozens, and my photograph is not quite as good, but dozens of fragments of what we call redware vessels. These are milk pans. They're big, deep pans that would have been used in a kitchen or really uh, in producing in milking animals and also in producing things like cheese. So these are food production vessels. And some of them, like this one in the top, are very heavily worn. You can see spouts on these two examples. It was used a lot. It's pretty beat up. This is what they'd look like if they were whole. Also in the deposit, and again, this is a representative sampling. There were I think like 70 fragments of this. Um, we have these, these platters, plates, cups, uh, dishes, and the ceramics, again, are pretty interesting from an archaeological perspective. This sort of whitish stuff is what we would call queensware or creamware. It's easy to figure out when it was made. It's about 1762 to 1820. Um, these fragments over here and over here are a little bit later ceramics, something called pearlware, made from about 1775 to 1840. We also have a little bit of porcelain, a tiny bit of whiteware. Whiteware starts being made about 1820. So we could say a couple things from this. First of all, somebody in the 17, late 1700s is setting a pretty fancy table. Um, however, these vessels, look at all those scratch marks. They have been used and abused. Um, so by this time period, they're probably sort of discards, um, sort of hand-me-downs. The other thing uh, we could say is, well, the deposit, even though it may have artifacts that go back to the 1760s, is probably from about the 18-teens or 20s, based on the presence of that whiteware vessel. The other thing that's interesting is, the pieces don't exactly match. Like it's not really a match set. It's almost like sort of a thrown together set of artifacts. There's what that creamware platter would look like if it were still intact. We had a little bit of uh, stoneware, but not very much. Uh, Monmouth County was famous. Monmouth and Middlesex counties were both famous for producing stoneware. Morgan pottery, Warren and Letts and, and others made beautiful stoneware vessels. Stoneware is mostly used for storing food, for preserving food, uh, rather than for cooking uh, food uh, or, or serving it. So there's less evidence for that. But again, here's a handle from a crock, not too different from this entire one, and bases of by four other crocks. There are only a handful of um, non-kitchen related items. A couple uh, medicine bottles seen here going into the early 19th century. Well, this is fun, this looks so strange, but what you're looking at here is a piece of glass from what would be called, um, sometimes people call them uh, eye windows. They're sort of oval windows that you see on the doors of 18th century houses. And in fact, uh, Marl Pitt Hall has windows on the front door just like this. There is a, uh, a big hanger for a pot, again, sort of kitchen related. And when we excavated, the artifacts we found were often smaller than those that had uh, been excavated by Joe. But again, we're finding pearlware, sort of shell edge pearlware, nice transfer printed pearlware. So this is early 19th century. And again, setting a fashionable table. There's um, evidence of gin consumption. This is what's called a case or a gin bottle. Uh, people in colonial America were really concerned with gin uh, in colonial Britain too. They thought that uh, gin was much too dangerous a drink and it could lead really to the end of 
civilization as we know it, a proper society. In fact, the famous artist William Hogarth uh, made a pair of images. One I think is called Gin Lane, and the other one, if I recall correctly, is Beer Alley. And it showed how beer was good for you, but gin led to all sorts of problems. But we have uh, fragments of several case bottles or gin bottles, and they're called case bottles because you could fit them into a trunk. That's why they have these nice square sides so you can transport them easily. We do have porcelain here and the Taylor family is very involved in trade with China uh, in the early 1800s. In fact, they make quite a fortune involved in that trade. So it was fun to find fragments of Chinese porcelain uh, as part of the archeological deposit. These are teacups and bowls that we're looking at. There's a lot of green, a uh, shell edge pearlware. And I've heard colleagues in Great Britain say that this stuff was made for the American market because the, the Brits thought it was very unattractive. I, I don't know if that's true, but what was striking to me is how we have a number of different sets. So it's almost as though somebody's cobbling together a set from similar pieces. Again, our excavations yielded more stoneware fragments, some other redware vessels, and, and some later, a later bottle, as you see here. And then perhaps the most curious artifact at all doesn't line up with anything else time-wise is a key to a door, much like you might purchase at, you know, your local hardware store. And we also had a button. Um, this is a sort of, sort of uh, milk glass button that would have been used, frankly, it would have been used on things like underwear uh, in, uh, 19th century America. So most of the artifacts are from the same time period, but some of them are a little bit later. I think the reason we're seeing those later artifacts is because there was an active garden here for a, there is an active garden here. So soil would have been turned a little bit and the deposit in that pit feature uh, probably became mixed. Some things are missing though. So typically if you did get an archeological site in New Jersey from this time period, especially in Monmouth County, well, you'd find a lot of nails. We have some nails, not too many. You'd find a ton of clam and oyster shells. We don't really have any clam and oyster shells here. You'd find lots of animal bones, especially if it's sort of food waste related to a, a kitchen. We have very few animal bones. Here. And there are not a lot of personal items either, things like tobacco pipes or coins. In fact, what we seem to have is what you might have in the cupboards of a kitchen, um, all being thrown out at once. So just to compare what we found at um, what we found at Marl Pit Hall with some other sites, and some sites that I've I've had the, the opportunity to work at. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Bonaparte's Point Breeze. Joseph Bonaparte's the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, and he lives uh, for about twenty years in Bordentown, New Jersey. He builds a, builds a big palatial house. It's actually you know probably three or four times as big as Moral Pit Hall, uh, though they overlap to some extent in time. And I got to work there several, year back, several years back with a good colleague, a uh, couple of great colleagues actually, Mike Gold, uh, Bill Schindler, Jerry Sharpenberger. And there we found lots of glass bottle fragments. Um, but interestingly enough, Joseph Bonaparte's nickname when he was King of Spain, he had quite a resume. As King of Spain, he was called uh, Pepe Botellas or, or sort of Joe Bottles. So we were not surprised to find lots of bottles there, but we were at Moral Pit Hall. Now this is a much more rustic place. This is uh, the Rittenhouse Log Cabin, which is out in Rosemont, New Jersey. It dates from the 1780s owned by a German family, just like that Rittenhouse Square in uh, Philadelphia. Excavations inside the house found a pit beneath the floor in front of a fireplace. It had artifacts that were actually strikingly similar to those from Marl Pit Hall. We've got these big milk pans here. They've been reconstructed. We're hoping to do that with some of the Marl Pit examples. We have some, what you might call pie plates, um, also made out of redware. We had some of those same types of pearlware vessels. This again, it's all coming out of a pit right in front of the hearth. Um, and we think this pit was probably like a little cold storage area. And then at some point, 
they they abandon it and put their trash in it. The nice thing about it is those pieces are really, really large. Uh, this is a house that many of you may know, the Johannes Leister house in, in Milltown as well. And Jerry Scharfenberger led an excavation there, a salvage excavation for, uh, for several years. And uh, it's a wonderful house. It's purported to be built with ship's timbers, uh, but it's certainly an Anglo-Dutch house or a Dutch Dutch house from the 18th century. There too, we found similar ceramics in those pearlware plates, uh, though a very unusual colander made out of redware. Um, this is a very Dutch style colander. Uh, and I should point out like we might use colanders today to make, I don't know, macaroni and cheese or spaghetti. Uh, colanders are being used by the Leisters and their contemporaries for things like washing shellfish, uh, they weren't really making a lot of uh, pasta dishes during this time period. So we have similar artifacts from other nearby sites. Some of them are coming out of these pits that are beneath the floor. I should have said with the Leicester house, those artifacts come out of what's probably a separate out kitchen just to the, um, just to the east of the house. Now, working with my awesome colleagues at the Monmouth County Historical Association, we were able to pull up some documents relating to Malpit Hall. And this is a particularly important one. Uh, this is what's called an inventory. And it's John Taylor's inventory and it's from 1818. So when a person passes away in colonial America, several of his or her neighbors would come through their house and they would write down literally every object in the house and what they thought it was worth. Now I haven't copied every page for you because this is a very long inventory. Um, but when we look at it, we can start seeing some of the things that we've been excavating. For instance, uh, 17 milk pans, three milk pans. Well, those redware vessels we have are milk pans. And then if we go on a little bit, there's a page that's even more interesting because here it has one lot of Queensware, green edge dishes and plates worth $7.50. We have Queensware green edge dishes and plates. One lot of old earthenware. We've got that too, $5. One lot of stoneware. $2.12. There's actually a lot less stoneware than there is earthenware or queensware, what I was calling before creamware, which is what archaeologists call. Now, it looks like this inventory is actually listing some of the things that we're finding. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is a sad aspect of this document, but it bears, uh, it bears pointing out. You'll notice is they continue to inventory the estate that people are actually listed in the inventory. And I think in Dana's introduction before, you heard the name uh, Ephraim. So Ephraim, a colored man, Marianne, a colored woman, Will, a boy, Betty, a girl, and then their debts owed to William Leonard. Um, so this is in a sense quite horrifying, right? Because here are people, real people who lived lives, who had feelings and thoughts, just like any of us, who are being held in bondage, uh, enslaved, and are listed with values as part of this inventory. And I'm going to try to draw kind of a, a connection here. Because one of the other discoveries that's been made uh, at Pearl Pit Hall is a pair of interesting, curious, unusual artifacts. And they are uh, what we might call barrel locks, or we might also call shackles. And these were not excavated by, by me, uh, nor, nor by the MCHA team. They were actually found by Rebecca Yeaman, a prominent Philadelphia archaeologist who worked at the site decades ago. And um, she inventoried them when they were found. But I don't think folks were thinking about the implications of them. So I think the question becomes, what were they being used for? 
uh, could they have been used to, to restrain someone? Do they in fact speak to the presence of people who were enslaved at this site? And they may, but I wanna be temperate in my interpretations because they also could have been used to lock up other sorts of things. They're, they're the equivalent of, of modern padlocks, um, but could have been used again many different and could have been used in many different ways. But seeing these artifacts and those artifacts in the inventory and the names of those individuals, I think raises some, some very interesting questions. And let me give you sort of the last slide for the interpretation part of this presentation. Um, so some of you may have heard of a technique called uh, GIS or technology, geographic information systems. And that allows you, among other things, it allows you to plot information on maps uh, with great exactitude. And in this case, I asked um, a novice at GIS, uh, my, my son Doug, to plot the Taylor Butler House and uh, Marl Pitt Hall on where they are today on a 19th century map. So the modern map is the background, historic map overlies it. And they don't perfectly match up, as you can see. But one thing that came away from this is, here is the current location of Mall Pit Hall. That's about where it shows up on this map in the late 19th century. And it makes me wonder if what Joe found and what we we're excavating is in fact a pit underneath the floor of the original Mall Pit Hall or Mall Pit Hall in its original location, perhaps the kitchen of Mall Pit Hall. And um, if so, those artifacts, that parcel of old earthenware, those Queensware plates could well have been associated with the enslaved people who lived and worked in this household and prepared uh, almost certainly the vast majority of the meals served there. Um, when were they deposited? Well, sometime after that inventory was taken, maybe in the 1820s or 30s, they don't seem to be much later than that, but they give us a glimpse of sort of a family uh, with considerable wealth that was doing some entertaining, um, but that's also, I would say somewhat frugal in that they're holding on to these items for decades after they were, they were fashionable. So that's, I would say, you know, I'm going to wrap up my presentation. It's sort of the start of the story because in many ways, the interpretation of these artifacts is ongoing. Uh, I have some colleagues who are busy cataloging them. We wash them. We're gonna to try to reconstruct some of those vessels and tell even more stories about the lives of Middletown's residents in the past from them as we come to better understand them. So thank you so much for your uh, attendance this evening. Um, and uh, I hope you found the presentation interesting. I certainly welcome uh, your comments, corrections, uh, and suggestions. And thanks to all the fine folks at the Monmouth County Historical Association, uh, Linda Bricker and her staff, as well as the folks who uh, participated in the dig. And of course, special thanks to my colleagues at Monmouth University and the Department of History and Anthropology who have you know, supported my interest in local archeology span for the past two decades. So thank you. That was wonderful, Dr. Veit. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Dan. I actually learned, I learned a lot, which is always fantastic. I just wanted to, um, can I share my screen for a second? Yeah, let me, I will stop and you have the helm. Okay. So before, when I was talking about Tavern Fest, I had like a little uh, technical difficulty and I zoomed along. I only finished half of it. I just wanna let you guys know that um, this is a big fundraiser for us and they will be having uh, live music, games, a barbecue dinner and an open bar. So what can be better than that? You can purchase those tickets on our website. So I just wanted to say that <laughs> so people know where to go. And then, um, okay, so we have upcoming our next 
lecture is Morbid Mammoth, and Bernadette Rogoff is going to be um, presenting that, which is going to be fantastic. It's going to be on October 28th. Um, and she'll be introducing us to the more macabre items in our collection, such as the Hook of Death, post-mortem imagery, wreaths of human hair, you have to see these things, um, and primitive surgical tools that were endured by our predecessors, among other bone-chilling things. And she'll tell you about the origins of these objects and some of the stories from our very own historic houses. Dr. Veit, you know the story of the massacre at the Allen House, correct? Yeah? Yes. So we're going to talk about some of the tragedies and pitfalls of centuries past. And you see here that our young Eleanor, um, this is Eleanor S. Conover. She's about four or five in this picture. She's not looking particularly healthy, right? So you're going to have to tune in to find out what's going on with um, Eleanor. So the lecture is going to be partially creepy, partially fun, totally interesting, as Bernadette always is. Um, and I think it's a good thing that it's a virtual lecture, because I think we'll be beating people off with sticks if it wasn't. So <laughs> we'll open it up for Dr. Veit. Um, questions? Let's see. We have the chat going. Hold on. Let me. Okay. And I appreciate all the thank yous in the chat. But, uh, thank you so much. But yeah, certainly do feel free to ask questions. I'm happy okay. to try to address them. Well, everybody's just saying fascinating, wonderful. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Okay. The, um, that pearlware, you were calling it pearlware? Yeah. So it looked like it had like an opalescent sheen to it. Was that actual pearls that are ground up into the glaze? No, but it, it has that sheen. And that's, that is a really nice observation because it is supposed to have that beautiful shine, almost like porcelain from China. That's what they're shooting for. Mm -hmm. So there are English potters in the 1700s, like Josiah Wedgwood. And they don't know the secret to making porcelain. It's like, it is a secret in China. So they're trying to replicate it and they get very close. And it does have a, you know, beautiful sheen. It looks good after 250 years in the ground. It's kind of yeah. amazing. That's amazing how it held up. Um, also the ice houses, like I always read about ice houses and I kind of just picture them almost like a smokehouse, but kind of like with a very deep base. Um, but I saw in that picture, it almost looked like it was, the dirt was like piled up above yeah, it's like it. mounded it's up and then it has this little peak on the top. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I mean, a couple things to think about. They're big, they're sort of like 10 feet across and 12 feet deep so you can get the ice down there. And then they have these sort of drainage systems to So the ice isn't sort of sitting in water as it, it slowly melts and they pack it in there with straw and with hay um, to keep it cool. Like the, you know, the original igloo cooler um, but often, because they have to get so deep, they do mound up that dirt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was an ice house found within, I guess, the past decade that's really interesting um, at what's called the President's House in Washington, D. not in Washington, D.C., rather in Philadelphia, where George Washington lived while he was president of the United States. So it's kind of fun to think of the Taylors uh, being in that sort of elite stratum of society where they have access to ice year-round. Mm -hmm. And they they also had um, access to lots of alcohol. <laughs> like they apparently did. They, they were having were fun. Throwing a lot of parties. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Ken is asking, um, do you ever come across kitchen utensils and tools in your recovered items? That's a great question because I really do feel like we're looking at a kitchen that was cleared out here. So sometimes we do, they tend not to preserve as well because a lot of them were iron and they, they may rust. But we do find uh, cutlery, uh, knives especially, sometimes with really nice sort of bone handles and forks. The forks are a little bit different. The, really, the colonial forks have like two tines. Um, so sometimes, sometimes we find kitchen utensils. They're not that common though, so good, mm -hmm. good question. Okay. Um, Joan is asking, why were things put under the floorboards? Were they hiding them, storing them, or tossing them out? Uh, I, I would say to that question, all of the above, I think. So, that, but it's really a good question. So in this case, I think they're discarding them, but in, they're discarding them in what probably had been a storage pit, uh, sort of like a little uh, ice cellar or a little cold room beneath the cellar. Archaeologists who've looked at similar sites in Virginia definitely have evidence for enslaved people hiding things mm -hmm. um, like writing implements, 
weapons in bits like this one. So it could have served, I bet it did in fact serve different functions at different points in time. And I'd imagine, you know, if we were in the building, it's probably accessed through like a, a trap door or something in the floor historically. That would be very typical. Okay. Um, are there efforts or plans? Oh, somebody was asking why Marl Pit was moved. Do you want to answer that and take that question? Yeah, and I see there's another, oh, there was another question a minute ago um, about moving it. So it's moved in 1919 because the road, uh, which goes by King's Highway, as it's heading up, I guess, to uh, to um, Keyport, is being straightened. So they want to get it further away from the, it's really a preservation effort on the part of, I guess, Mary Holmes Taylor III, who wants to save this house. She recognizes how important it is because of its early history. So they're moving it. Unfortunately, the records are variable in terms of how they describe that move. And in fact, in terms of how far it gets moved. So that's something that archaeology could help us sort of figure out. Um, are there efforts or plans in place to continue digging around the garden and the vicinity there? Not at this point. We're working through the artifacts we found, but I, I would say, you know, it's, it's something certainly to think about for the future because it's an exceedingly productive site. It's a really, really important site. And this, this dig, am I, is this correct? Um, that it was funded in part by PNC, right? Back in 2019, I believe we got a $5,000 grant. Meg had secured indeed. us, yeah. Yeah, so, and I should have given them that. Thank you for mentioning that because I should have mm -hmm. given them a shout out. That yeah, made, no, that's- That's what made it all possible. Yeah, so thank you to PNC for really helping us to, um, to do that important work. All right, uh, let's see, who else? <sighs> So somebody's saying the Marl Pit Hall was moved in about 1870. I that um, I don't I don't think that's correct. It was 1919, right? That Marl Pit was moved. I had 1919 from the information I looked at, but you know I get there could be other information out there that I'm certainly in. There is. There's a Taylor genealogy um, that has some facts that don't 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 seem to line up. You know, okay. I think maybe I did see it in that particular book, but. Um, why would they place a boot under the floorboards? Was this an English custom? Do we have a boot under the floorboard there? We may have someone lurking here with insider information. I did. We did not find a boot in uh, my excavation, um, but Joe has found, and Bernadette have found, uh, all sorts of items sort of uh, hidden away in the house, including some pieces of cloth. And and the question about a boot is, is a really interesting one. I don't know if any have been found hidden in the walls at Oral Pit. They may, there may have been, but a lot of colonial houses do have boots or shoes hidden around the hearth, by the fireplace, under a doorstep. And it seems to be a form of almost like magical protection. So if you imagine, if you think about today, how you might have a uh, horseshoe hanging over the entrance to a barn to sort of keep the good luck in. These boots and shoes seem to have been used to sort of keep bad spirits out. I don't know if it's supposed to like literally kick them out, but they're, they're not uncommon. And the question is to, I have to leave it open-ended as to whether or not there's one at Moral Pit, but other houses, the Stats House in South Bound Brook definitely had them, and Case DeVore House in Hunterdon County has has had them found there. Hmm. Cool. Oh, I saw I saw a question. I think it was from Rick Gefkin about why the name Moral Pit Hall, and so I don't have exact information, but I do know that um, in Middletown and other parts of uh, Monmouth County, Moral which is sort of like a tiny little fossilized creature that has become sort of a lime rich deposit, was mined in the 19th century to improve farms. And it made, it made people a lot of money and it really helped improve uh, agriculture. And Hall, I think, because the house was a grand house um, in its day. So 
that's what I have now, but it's a really good question. I have to get more information on that. Um, I think I saw, oh, Ken Magos asked, uh, will you be returning to Point Breeze? So Point Breeze was the Bonaparte estate and will I be returning there? And in fact, I will in a not too distant future. So that Bonaparte estate was acquired by uh, DNR Greenway Land Trust had been up for sale. Um, and they have what they call a gardener's cottage, which is a very nice house. Um, they wanna reinterpret those historic gardens. So we're gonna do a little bit of archeology span looking for the garden. So that should be fun. And, and that, that will happen this fall. Okay, very cool. Actually, so to the question about the boot, he wasn't saying that um, a boot was found at Marlpit. He was saying he found a boot in his house. Oh! <laughs> under, so he was just curious if that was a custom. I, that, that was like a little confused. I'm sorry about that. That that was, no, that was a custom, and you know, uh, here let me. Um, I'm going to put my email because there are a lot of questions now. If folks want to email with questions, and I'd love to hear more about the boot because a couple colleagues and I were actually working on a. This is just sounds so silly, but we were working on a census of like boots and shoes that were hidden in old houses because we wanted to write something about sort of folk magic in, in early America. So I'd love to hear about his boot. All right. Uh, so there, there's my email. There you go. You can talk to, uh, to Rich directly. <laughs> what what about, else do okay. we have? Uh, there was one. This is a good question. Um, you, it's, uh, she was asking, Moppet Hall doesn't appear to face King's Highway. So is it unusual for a house to sit sideways to the road? It does sit sideways to the road. That's a great point. So I think what um, what we see with a lot of 18th century houses, some some will certainly face the road. And the King's Highway is an early road. It predates Mall Pit Hall, right? It's one of the first, first roads in the state. It probably evolves out of an Indian trail. Um, but oftentimes they're facing their houses sort of due south uh, to try and catch as much sunlight in those sort of front rooms as they can. Mm -hmm. um, because really in terms of lighting, it's, it's ambient light, it's sunlight, and it's, it's light from windows and often they don't have too many windows mm -hmm. uh, or from candles or perhaps oil lamps. Uh, so that, you know, warms up the front of the house and keeps it better lit. So I think that's why it faces the direction it does. Mm -hmm. Like the light is actually more important than, than the road. Right. And no Honeywell, right? We didn't have um, temperature control back then. Right. <laughs> Have you come across any American Indian artifacts in these digs? That's a that's a good question as well. So um, we have not at at these sites, um, but I think Monmouth County generally has some incredibly important Native American sites. And a few years back, my students at Monmouth and I got to work at Turkey Swamp Park, which some of some of our listeners may have visited, and um, there are you know, incredibly important Native American sites there that go back eight, ten thousand years, from like five hundred years ago to ten thousand years ago. So that that's Amazing. been a place people have been visiting and living at for a very long time. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? No, I think we've come to the end of it. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. This was wonderful. All right, Dana, thanks for being a great host and having me here this evening. Thanks everyone for attending. You know, feel free to email with other questions. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.